Tonight, we start a series on wisdom and work. Wisdom and work. What does God, through the wisest man who ever, has to, who ever lived, have to say about the topic of work and uh, hard work and the work ethic? So we will be uh, maybe three, four, something like that, messages on the topic of wisdom and work. And uh, we begin tonight in Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. So when I, uh, when I was a kid, I grew up reading. And uh, I've always loved to read. I started out reading like the Hardy Boys and the Boxcar Children, kind of riveting literature. And uh, I never stopped reading. I kept reading. Keep I read even to this day. And uh, one thing that's kind of new, though, in the world of reading for me, uh, is over the last several years, I've started to read a lot of biographies. And I really like biographies. And, uh, of course, biographies are uh, stories about people's lives. And so over the last several years, I've read all kinds of biographies about presidents, generals, dictators, criminal kingpins, double agents, con men, cult leaders, religious wackos, and a whole lot more because biographies teach you an awful lot about people. See, the ceiling is limitless when you read a biography because you can look through their eyes and walk through their steps in their life. And so when you read a biography, you can, uh, you can learn from their experiences, their failures, their tragedies, their triumphs, their relationships, their perspectives, their habits, their attitudes. You can learn what to do and you can learn what not to do. So that's why this evening... I want to start reading a biography with you. I want to start reading a biography, and you could say we're going to go on a literary adventure together, a biographical journey. And our biographical journey was composed by a man named Solomon. King Solomon, wisest man who ever lived. And he's going to write a story about a man in the book of Proverbs, about a man he mentions 14 times in 31 chapters. Solomon calls him by the name of the sluggard. I've given him a new name for our purposes. I'm going to call him Lazy Boy Larry. So tonight we're going to read the biography of the sluggard, a.k.a. Lazy Boy Larry. And we're going to read his biography, and we're going to glean six life lessons from Lazy Boy Larry. Six life lessons from Lazy Boy Larry. Three tonight, you got to come back next week for the last three. So we'll get six life lessons, and by the way, these life lessons come by way of opposites, come by way of opposites, because like I said, biographies teach you what to do and what not to do. Well, Lazy Boy Larry is a study in what not to do. So tonight we're going to find three life lessons, and we'll turn them into what to do based on what not to do. So, if you're taking notes, we're going to begin with life lesson number one, be a productivity promoter. Life lesson number one, gleaned from Lazy Boy Larry, is be a productivity promoter, which is to say, be somebody who works hard, be somebody who gets things done, who accomplishes goals and tasks. You see, Lazy Boy Larry, his life would have been much improved had he learned this lesson when he was your age. But see, Lazy Boy Larry, as you're going to see in his biography, never learned this lesson. And the first line of his biography informs us of this lack in Lazy Boy Larry's life. Proverbs 6.6. 6. We're going to look at verse 6. Verses 6 through 11 is where part of his biography comes. And the first line gives us a lot of insight into Lazy Boy Larry. Go to the ant, O sluggard, observe her ways and be wise. And we'll pause there. And what immediately jumps out about lazy boy Larry is that Solomon issues three rapid fire commands. Did you see that? Go, observe, be wise. Well, it's interesting that the first thing he tells you about lazy boy Larry is that lazy boy Larry doesn't like to act. And I know that because that's why Solomon is compelled to give three rapid-fire commands. Go, observe, be wise. Because Lazy Boy Larry doesn't like to act on anything. Lazy Boy Larry is a lazy boy, and he avoids work, and he avoids anything productive. 
That's why Solomon calls him sluggard. Because in the Old Testament, the word sluggard means somebody who's low, or rather not low, slow and lazy. But slow isn't mental slowness. Slow and lazy combines to mean somebody who has no discipline and no motivation. Today, in common language, you'd say, oh, he's a slacker, right? Lazy boy Larry is a slacker. He's a deadbeat. He's a lazy bum. Well, you're right. Yeah, that's lazy boy Larry. And in today's culture, the extreme version of lazy boy Larry looks a little bit like this. See, he's the guy who still lives at home, and he's 24, and he doesn't pay rent, and his mom still folds his laundry and cooks his meals, and he can barely hold down a minimum wage job because his boss is mean and his schedule's tough, and his customers aren't very nice. So lazy boy Larry just has a hard life. But the less extreme version... Equally shameful, embarrassing, but less extreme. This is the girl who sets five alarms every morning and still snoozes six times. And she can't, she gets away with it because she says, I'm just not a morning person. And then she's got a gym membership. She's had it since 2018, but she's only gone four times. And so her screen time on her phone, average screen time is four hours. Her average word time is non-existent because she doesn't even know where her Bible is. It's lost somewhere in that wilderness called her floor with all the dirty clothes strewn about. So that's the sluggard. And you might hear that and you kind of laugh because it's kind of funny. But actually, Solomon doesn't tell you this is a joke. He tells you this because he has no regard no uh there's no honor in being a sluggard see solomon is not complimenting lazy boy larry by saying you sluggard actually when when we go through the biography of lazy boy larry what you're going to find is solomon repeatedly uses uh things like satire sarcasm ridicule scorn and condescension to talk about lazy boy larry He's got nothing but distaste for lazy boy Larry. And the interesting thing is, because you might hear that and say, whoa, satire, sarcasm, that's ungodly. Yeah, but the Holy Spirit inspired it. So this is not ungodly the way Solomon, Solomon talks about him. Solomon is actually sharing God's perspective on a guy who's a lazy rascal. So God's view of lazy boy Larry, we know it, Because Solomon writes it, God's view is really dim. God is not impressed with Lazy Boy Larry. So Lazy Boy Larry, his his photo hangs on God's wall, but it's not on the wall of fame, it's on the wall of shame. And the main reason, the main reason why Solomon has no love for Lazy Boy Larry, the reason God has no love for Lazy Boy Larry, is because he has limitless laziness. Right, And his life is summarized in Proverbs 21, 25. The desire of the sluggard puts him to death, for his hands refuse to work. Spurgeon said it this way. He, he, he's talking about the sluggard. He takes great pains to escape from pains. Which means he works really hard so he doesn't have to work hard. He works hard to avoid working hard. He's like the man who said, hard work never killed anyone, but hey, why take a chance? He's like the other guy who said, I like work. It fascinates me. I can stare at it for hours. And that's Lazy Boy Larry's attitude. See, Lazy Boy Larry, he likes to think about work, but it's a dreadful thing to do work. Which is why Solomon says, On the opening paragraph of the biography of Lazy Boy Larry, Larry, you need to get busy. And that's actually good advice for many of us, right? Because Solomon isn't just talking to Lazy Boy Larry. He's talking to the Lazy Boy Larry who lives in all of us. See, we all ought to be productivity promoters, which is to say we need to get busy employing our lives to do productive things. Some of you, that starts by getting a job, right? For too long, you've lived at home off of mom and dad's kindness, and you sort of take an advantage of their graciousness, but you really need to get a job so you can start contributing. 
But others, you got a job. You've been working for a long time. But maybe for you, you've been a bit of a tumbleweed, right? You, you roll from job to job, and you can't really find a job that you like or a boss who's nice or schedules that convenient. So after a few months, you say, you know what? I'm going to go check out the Wendy's down the street. Maybe they'll have a better job for me. And so you hop from position to position, and you don't really accomplish anything, but your resume has like nine jobs in six months. So the idea here, right off the bat, verse 6 in Larry's, Lazy Larry's biography is, let's put our hand to the plow and be productive. Right? Let's start working and working hard and accomplishing things. And it's not rocket scientists, well, not rocket science, as we're going to see in the rest of uh, this passage here. But let me give you a few ways that you can be productive at work. Right, we'll just narrow it right now to the, the field of your job. You can be productive by showing up on time. Right? Don't be seven minutes late every day. Be there on time, maybe even early. And then one way to be productive is, is work the entire shift, right? Like actually labor and, and do your job for the full eight hours or 10 hours or six hours or kind of whatever your shift is. And don't take a break every hour and say, you know what, I kind of got to rest my mind, so I'm going to go talk to my coworker, and then it's like, wow, we just talked for 25 minutes. Hey, that's great. My day's going faster. And then you go back to work for a little bit. And one thing that I think gets everybody is about this big and this wide, and it's called a smartphone. And what we do is, at work, we have this compulsion to check our phone. Maybe there's a notification. Maybe I missed a new uh, text message. Maybe somebody responded in Slack and I didn't see it. And so instead of working, we're constantly checking our phone and then responding. You've probably seen it. I don't know how many times I've seen it. You go to like a restaurant, right? Somebody's taking your order at the front and you look around the back in the kitchen and you got some guy leaning against the wall like out of the view of the security camera where his manager can't see him. And then he's just checking his phone. He's texting. And you're like, dude, I know if your manager saw you, he would not be happy because they're not paying you to scroll Instagram. They're paying you to work. And so those kinds of activities like, hey, that's walking in lazy boy Larry's footsteps. But Solomon is saying there's a better path to take. And the truth is all of us have some of lazy boy Larry in ourselves. Right? Even the hardest working among us there are areas of our life where we actually are lazy boy Larry. Maybe it's not your job. Maybe you kill it. You know, you work really hard. But when it comes to your finances or to home life or to some other element of life, you're actually super unproductive. And what Solomon says to lazy boy Larry would be a good advice to you. He says, go to the ant, oh sluggard. And you might hear that and you say, what in the world? Why would I go to the ant? Like that little bitty creature that I find in my kitchen going after my breadcrumbs or I see it in the grass, it's built this huge mound and they're always swarming in little paths across the sidewalk. You know, like go to that creature, go to that little thing and learn. Yeah, that's what Solomon says. And he says, go to the ant, observe her ways, and be wise. And what he's saying is not, I just want you to go look and watch the ants do this and that. No, he says, observe. That word observe is more than sight. That word is think about it, perceive, regard, understand, learn. What it is, is it's, it's contemplation and observation mixed together. So you look and you think about it, and then the purpose, right, is so that you'll live differently, so that it will drive some kind of behavior change. And I think it's interesting that at the very first bit of the biography about Lazy Boy Larry, Solomon gives this command to go to an ant. And if you're Lazy Boy Larry, like that's a bit insulting, kind of offensive, a little bit demeaning, because you might imagine Lazy Boy Larry responding like this. Okay, so let me get this straight, Solomon. You want me, a human being, to go and find the ant. Tiny little creature, like not even a fraction of an inch, weighs nothing at all, and you want me to go and like spend time looking at this thing and learn something? Like what on earth, Solomon? And then Solomon says, yeah, 
You got it, Lazy Boy Larry. That is precisely what I'm telling you to do. And then Lazy Boy Larry kind of snorts and he says, why? And then Solomon says, well, because when you observe the ant, when you watch the ant and you don't just look, you actually consider the ant's characteristics, then, Lazy Boy Larry, you will become wise. And maybe, and this is an interesting point here, he says, and then be wise. Which means, Lazy Boy Larry, you're not wise. And there's something the ant can teach you about wisdom. And maybe you thought, hey, wisdom is esoteric knowledge. It's kind of like intellectual. It's thoughts. But, but Solomon says, no, 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 no. Wisdom is practical. Wisdom is nuts and bolts living. Wisdom is very simple things that translate into effective, successful living. And so Solomon says, I want you to have that, lazy boy, Larry. You don't need a PhD. You don't need to go to Hebrew University. You just need to go look at the ant to be a productivity promoter, which leads us to point number two, second life lesson from the biography of Lazy Boy Larry, is be a self-starter, right? Be a productivity promoter and be a self-starter, which is to say, be the kind of person who takes initiative, the kind of person who tackles a project or a task without having to be asked or ordered, You're a self-starter. You just initiate because you're internally motivated. But see, if you want to learn how to do that, you're not going to learn it from Lazy Boy Larry because Lazy Boy Larry doesn't live this way. See, he's not a self-starter. He's what you would call a never-starter because Lazy Boy Larry will never initiate anything on his own except maybe a nap. And if Lazy Boy Larry had a spirit animal, it would be the sloth. His spirit insect is the slug. And so Lazy Boy Larry is commanded by Solomon to go and watch the ant. Because the sad thing is, and this is an implicit rebuke to Lazy Boy Larry, the ant is more noble than Larry. The ant is more noble because the ant actually has initiative. And that comes through very clearly in verse 7. We'll read 7 and 8, which, and this is the description of the ant, having no chief officer or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. Well, listen, unlike Lazy Boy Larry, the ant is a self-starter. This is a gal who has initiative. She's internally motivated. She's self-directed. She doesn't need somebody to swat her on the backside to get her moving and get active. She's already moving. She's already active. And that is all contained in verse 7, having no chief officer or ruler. And you might say, well, what's he talking about? Was this a bureaucracy? Well, basically... That word chief is somebody who is responsible to decide matters and settle questions. In Isaiah chapter 1, that word is used to talk about somebody who makes sure that other people uphold the law. Well, see, the ant doesn't need one of those in her life. The ant does not need a chief in her life. She doesn't need somebody to settle disputes about job expectations and work hours and work-life balance and responsibilities. That's superfluous for her because she works so hard, the chief wouldn't have anything to say to her. Next, you see that she has no officer. That word officer is used in Exodus chapter 5, five times to talk about the foremen, like the work supervisors, who made sure that the Israelites uh, hit their quota of bricks, right? You remember they're in Egypt. They were under the um, authority occupation of, of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, hey, you need to work hard, build these monuments and, and cities for me. So it starts with bricks. You need to make a certain number of bricks every day. And these foremen, which same word for officer, they're there to say, hey, I need you to hit your quota today. You got to work a little bit harder. Well, see, the ant doesn't need a foreman. She never needs someone to look over her shoulder. She doesn't need someone to make certain she's at her cubicle working hard because, listen, the ant is always working hard. This gal doesn't take a break. She always meets her quotas. She always meets her deadlines. You never have to worry about that with the ant. That last term, ruler, 
No, chief officer or ruler. That is someone who exercises authority over a subordinate. Today you would say, oh, that's my boss, right? Who exercises authority over me, the subordinate. That's my boss. That's my direct report. Maybe it's my manager. All of that, that's what he's talking about here. So he says, listen, the aunt, she doesn't have a boss. She doesn't have a direct report. She doesn't have a, a supervisor, a manager, a shift supervisor, because why would she need that level of authority? She always does what is needed. No, superv no supervisor monitoring her, no manager bringing or breathing down her neck, no boss knocking on the door and saying, hey, when are you going to get that report submitted? I needed it last night at 6. Well, that never happens because she's always done it. It's always done. Like, working hard is in this aunt's DNA. It's who she is. Nobody needs to encourage her. Hey, you really, you really kind of got to buckle down and work hard. Okay, like your performance is slacking. Nobody has ever said that to the ant because she's always on task and there's never a moment where she's not on task, which again is why Solomon says, go to the ant. So I sort of literally did that a few weeks ago. Edna and I were in Colombia, South America. I got a brother, he's a missionary. So he just bought a house. He's got some land, on, and so he was giving us a tour of the house. And so we were kind of walking on the hillside around the house, and as we were going, I saw these little trails, like this this wide, just kind of dirt trails through the yard. And I was thinking, why? Because the rest of it is grass. What do you got these random trails for? So I kind of got down, and I was, I looked to see what was up with these little dirt tracks, these trails, paths through his yard. Well, I saw something moving on these paths. And when I looked closer, it was ants. Just zillions of ants just constantly streaming and scurrying down these little paths. And I thought, how in the world did they manage to like, did they trample the grass down because they walked so much on this path because they're always moving? Well, no, what I found out is they're, they're uh, leaf-cutting ants. So what they do is they literally, with their pinchers, they chop down all the grass, all the vegetation. They make a super highway so they can go to the leaves and cut them down and then bring them back to the nest. And so these ants had not only, like, meticulously cleaned these paths free of any kind of grass or vegetation um, so that they had just a straight highway to the nest... But then what caught my eye is how ceaselessly busy the ant was. I mean, there was just constant motion, constant movement here and there, and the ants were never taking a break. And it was wild. They were crazy productive. And you know, as I looked at those ants, there were some things that I realized, oh, you don't find this when you watch ants. One of those is you don't see ants taking a break, right? There were no ants napping on the side of the little ant road in an ant hammock. They were all running here and there. See, there were no ants ducking behind a stick and checking their little ant ants Instagram. They were just running. And you know what? There wasn't, there wasn't a single ant leaning against the blade of grass and flirting with his ant co-worker. They were all just working. And it was so impressive. And then another thing I didn't see with this little ant superhighway, there were no ant supervisors. There were no ants cracking their tiny little ant whips and then swatting them and saying, move it, Larry! Because they didn't need instruction. They didn't need uh, reinforcement to work hard because, goodness gracious, that's all they did is work hard. I mean, those things were ceaselessly active. They are constantly, energetically engaged in their work. And that's who the ant is. The ant is a self-starter. You don't have authority structures with ants to promote labor productivity because that's coded into the ant's DNA. They just do it. Ants are self-starters. Motivated, disciplined, dedicated. So when Solomon says, lazy boy Larry, go to the ant. And by the way, in, in Palestine, in the land of Israel, there's over a hundred species of ants. 
100 species of ants. This one is probably the harvester ant, right? Mesor semiferous. That's the genus and species. Mesor semiferous. That's a scientific name for this kind of ant that Solomon is talking about because they, they have them in Palestine, in Israel. That's what he would have been watching. And so lazy boy Larry really needs to go to the ant and needs to peer down and he needs to just watch them and just watch them and not do anything except learn from these tiny little creatures. And the lesson he should learn is, lazy boy Larry, you got to be a self-starter. You need to be the kind of person who is internally motivated Internally motivated to get out of bed, to go to work, to work hard, to complete your assignments on time, to make as many burgers as you're required, or fill out the reports, or document whatever. Like, looking to be effective, productive, and make a contribution to wherever you're at. And there's a few places where this kind of self-starter attitude is important. So as I talk about it, I would encourage you, maybe just evaluate yourself in these different arenas of life. Because one place where it's sort of obvious that you could be a self-starter, that's at work. Right? You can be a self-starter at work. And one of the ways that happens is when things are slow and you say, like, I finished my project on time and I'm waiting for more work, you have two options. You can pull out your phone like most people and start scrolling. Or... You can go to your manager and say, hey, I got the project done. Do you have anything else that I can do? Or you can go to your coworker and say, hey, um, I finished the project on time. You, anything else I can do to help you with this? I got free time. I'm willing to help you, support you on this, this next phase of the project. And I love Edna, my wife, because she's so good at that. Sometimes at her job, it gets really slow. I've never had a slow day in my life as a pastor. But sometimes work can slow down, and sometimes it does for Edna. And so what she does, and she tells me this often, and I love it, is she'll go to her boss and say, hey, I finished it. Is there anything else I can do? Any other work you need me to do? Or she'll go to her coworker and say, hey, do you have any tasks that I can work on? Is there anything you can teach me how to do so I can now support you in more ways in the office? Right, That's the perfect attitude. So you can be a self-starter at work by cultivating that kind of mentality. And by the way, if if they say like, John, I don't have any work for you. Like, I don't have anything to do. Then instead of saying, oh, good, well, now I have liberty to go back to my desk and watch YouTube videos for an hour. Instead, you say, how can I be a better employee? Is there anything I can even say, watch a tutorial online to become better at, say, Excel because I use that for my job? Or is there any coworker who I can go and say, hey, can you teach me how to do this so, uh, so I'm a better contributor to the company? You can also be a self-starter at home, right? This is outside of the work realm, at home. So you don't need to wait to fix the broken garage door or to repair the drippy sink or to uh, patch the hole in your roof, don't wait until it's a crisis. Just see, ah, this needs to be done. Let me do it. Let me grab my tools. And if you say, I don't actually know how to do it, well, no worries. Find somebody who's handy, who's crafty, and say, hey, would you be willing to come over on Saturday morning? I'll buy you breakfast. Uh, Would you help me patch this hole in my fence? Would you help me fix the plumbing on my toilet? I mean, you don't have to sleep in until 9 on a Saturday. You can be productive. Or if you say, hey, listen, I'm not good at keeping up with my car. You know, like my tires, they're so bald. You know, if I hit a pothole on the freeway, I'm going to have a blowout, and I'm probably going to get in an accident. Don't be a procrastinator. Listen, be a self-starter and say, hey, I need to buy new tires. Let me go and figure out. Let me get on online and say, hey, what are the best tires for my car, and where can I get the best price? Or if you're 5,000 miles over when you need to get an oil change, don't wait more until you, like, burn up on the freeway. Just look up where you can get a decent oil change and go on Saturday morning. Right? So you can be a self-starter there. But you can be a self-starter in the realm of finances. Some of you might thrive here. Many of you, because you're still young, you might not have had any real kind of instruction here. Maybe you're you're not where you're at financially. In that, you don't monitor your expenses. You don't save and invest. Maybe you don't have a budget. And you just kind of spend what you got. Money in is money out. And at the end of the month, you're like, where did it all go? 
I got 16 pairs of shoes and 47 dresses, but where did it go? Well, see, what you can do is you can start today and you can figure out how to have a budget, how to live within your means. I just, I'm reading a book about a guy who's uh, Brian Regan. He worked for the, uh, the government, the NRO, National Reconnaissance Offer, Office, and the guy tried to sell state secrets, American secrets, to Libya. And so he got caught, and they figured out that one of the reasons he was doing it is because he got, he was like $120,000 in debt on his credit cards. He didn't have the money, but he spent it like he did. And he was up a creek financially because he had, he wasn't a self-starter. This guy was in a full-blown crisis. And that's why he says, oh, I can get rich and make $13 million by selling secrets to Libya. No, he ended up in prison for 40 years. So don't, don't wait. Don't be a never starter with your money. Be a self-starter. And if you say, I, I don't know. I didn't take finance in college. The church actually has Financial Peace University, a class that teaches you how to get your money in order, right? Or just find somebody in the room who's older and looks like they might have a handle on it. So there are relational applications, too, to this self-starter kind of mode. You want to be a self-starter relationally. And I don't mean dating. I mean if you're in conflict with somebody. Let's say you had a little tiff with somebody. And and self-starter mode here when it comes to relationships is, let me not let this thing escalate into a full-blown conflict. If I sinned against him and he sinned against me or she said this about me and then I responded by saying this about her, let me just initiate. Let me go to her and seek forgiveness. Let me say, hey, I was wrong. I sinned against you. I have to do this all the time with Edna because I sin against her all the time. But if, I was, if, if both of us weren't self-starters, our relationship would blow up because we'd have mountains of undealt with conflict. So relationally, you can be a self-starter by saying, man, I know I committed sin. I need to go to that guy and ask for his forgiveness. I need to go to that girl and let her know my behavior was wrong. My attitude was sinful. But see, you can be a self-starter in another place too. This one is both spiritual and relational, right? This way to be a self-starter is where you say, I want to be married one day. So how do I get where I want to be? Well, rather than saying, oh, let me go to the gym, let me lose weight, let me get, you know, more toned, let me get a better tan, clear up my complexion, let me get some dental work done, let me get my nails done. I mean, you can, not terrible things to do, but why don't you focus instead on being a godly person, right? Why don't you say, hey, let me be the kind of person that a godly person would want to marry, which means I need to be consistent in the Bible. Let me be a self-starter and wake up and open my Bible. Let me be a self-starter and and learn how to pray. Let me be a self-starter and pursue Jesus Christ, who is the treasure The treasure doesn't come in your paycheck. The treasure comes right here. So if you say, hey, one day I want to be married, that's a great desire. But if the fulfillment seems illusory and long way off, no better way than to uh, be a self-starter and say, let me be the kind of man or woman that a godly man or woman wants to marry. And then you're not consumed with relationship. You're consumed with godliness. And then you're in the right spot to be a candidate for a real relationship. So learning from Lazy Boy Larry, not only do we need to be productivity promoters, which Lazy Boy Larry has never been that, but we also see that we want to be a self-starter. He's a never-starter, but you don't want to be that. You want to be a self-starter. And I've given you a bunch of categories to think through. And my guess is if you're anything like me, you've got a lot of opportunity to respond here. But there's one more life lesson, right? One more lesson from Larry's biography that we're going to get to tonight. You want to be a productivity promoter. You want to be a self-starter. Lesson number three gleaned from the biography of Lazy Boy Larry is, and this comes in verse eight, be a moment maker. Be a moment maker, which simply means make the most of every opportunity. The phrase today is strike while the iron is hot. Right, because lazy boy Larry has really never, ever made the most of the moment. He is the king of squandering opportunities. He's an opportunity waster, not a moment maker. 
See, the only thing he's capitalized on is the reach to hit snooze one more time. But the other opportunities of life, man, lazy boy Larry has let them sail along. His life is summarized in Proverbs 26, 14. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the sluggard on his bed. Lazy boy Larry has a love affair with his pillow. His motto is, never do today what can be put off until tomorrow. Or better yet, as Mark Twain said, never put off till tomorrow what may be done the day after tomorrow. And lazy boy Larry hears that and he says, that's wisdom. That is life insight. Because lazy boy Larry is always trying to get out of work. You know, if you were Lazy Boy Larry, you would notice that he's the last guy into the office every day. And his car is the first one to leave the parking lot every evening. Lazy Boy Larry doesn't like to work. He doesn't like to work while he has the opportunity to work. So Solomon says, go Watch the ant, lazy boy Larry, because you will learn from the ant, from that tiny, little, busy, bustling, scurrying creature, you will learn, lazy boy Larry, how to make the most of every moment. And that's what we find the ant doing very busily in verse 8. We already know that she doesn't need an authority structure to compel her to work hard. She just works hard because it's who she is. But in verse 8, here's what she does. She prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. Food in summer, provision in harvest. This is the harvester ant, right? Let me give you a few more inf- uh, details about the harvester ant. Let me give you some insight. So the harvester ants, they build their nests underground. They don't build mounds, their nest is underground. Their primary food source is not animal byproduct. Their primary food source is plants and vegetables. But especially They eat grain. They eat grain. And that's why you notice Solomon gave two time uh, markers in the summer and in the harvest. Well, the reason he says that is because that's when harvester ants work the hardest. Because grain is their primary food supply. So in the summer months, that's what's uh, communicated by in the summer and in the harvest. Those are the summer months, right? That's when the barley ha- harvest happens. That's when the wheat harvest happens. That's when the mo- ants are the most active because that's when the food supply is the most abundant. And so she is busy preparing and gathering, right? Ants in, in Israel during those harvest months for the barley and wheat harvest, they are constantly scurrying through the fields, through the threshing floors, through the the barns, and they are looking for grain. And they're grabbing every single one they can find, and they're taking it back to the nest, and they're going underneath, and they're storing it in their perfectly built storehouses so that when winter comes, when there's no more grain, they're okay. They got plenty of food because they're moment makers. The door is open to gather food. And so the harvester ant says, I'm going to be out there gathering. They never waste an opportunity. Harvester ants work while there's work to do. You know, the ant has never heard the phrase carpe diem, seize the day, but their life is the expression of carpe diem. They seize every day and every minute and every moment. But lazy boy Larry... Yeah, he just lets the moments pass him by. See, Proverbs 20, verse 4, it adds to his biography. Here's what Solomon says, Proverbs 20, verse 4. The sluggard does not plow after the autumn, so he begs during the harvest and has nothing. Lazy boy Larry misses his opportunity to reap. He's begging instead. He's not getting food because he didn't put in the work in advance. He didn't have the forethought, the foresight to say, I better work hard while I can so that in the leaner months I'm okay. Easy boy Larry doesn't think further than his nose. He doesn't have anything planned on the calendar for tomorrow or the next day or the next day or any day thereafter. 
Lazy boy Larry is a live-by-the-day kind of guy, and it bites him. He begs during the harvest and has nothing. And Solomon highlights him as an example of a shameful individual. Proverbs 10, verse 5. I mean, he just straight up calls him out. He who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely, but he who sleeps in, in harvest is a son who acts shamefully. Because he's sleeping when you're supposed to be working. Well, that's lazy boy Larry. And lazy boy Larry's misdeeds are a, an opportunity for you and I to learn. Right? We can learn from lazy boy Larry. We can be like the ant, the harvester ant. We can be moment makers, not opportunity wasters. Maybe you've heard the expression, make hay while the sun shines. Kind of an older expression. The idea is take advantage of the moment while the moment exists. Capitalize on every opportunity you have to grow and mature and improve yourself. So let me lovingly meddle in your lives for a moment. Right? What does it look like in real terms to be a moment maker, right? to not waste and squander opportunity? Well, for some of you, it means get off Twitch, stop watching other people play video games. right? But it also means get off video games yourself, put down the headset, set down the controller, get off of League of Legends or Lethal Company and Call of Duty, and go do something that matters, right? Or it could mean, and this one is like really convicting because it gets probably every one of us, put down your phone, right? You don't have to check for a new text message every 60 seconds. You don't have to scroll on Instagram for hours just to see what's cool and new, right? And it also could mean, hey, rethink your subscription to Netflix, Hulu, and Apple TV. I mean, do you really need them? I think they survived a lot of years without those. And they did a lot of productive things. Is it sin to have them? No. But I'm saying, let me give you some ways to think about being a moment maker, to capitalize on the season while you have it. Summer is here. The sun is shining. The harvest stands ready. So Solomon's words to lazy boy Larry and to us is, get busy, get working while it's good to work. And it's interesting because a lot of you are in a season of life, which is, for most of you, statistically, it's going to be a limited season. A rare opportunity, though, in the season called singleness. And maybe you think it's, it's a season that's a curse, right? I hate being single. I just want to be married. Real happiness is out there on the horizon where marriage is. And so you're just trying to survive this season of singleness. That's not everybody, but that's some of you. There's a room full of 90% singles. And so the summer of singleness is now, right? So Solomon's words to you would be, be like the ant and work while the harvest is ready. So don't waste the season of singleness. Here's how you waste your single season of singleness. You chase fashion. You chase entertainment, you chase fun and pleasure and whatever you want, every pursuit, you just chase it because <clears throat> you're just trying to get through singleness to find the ideal life, which is marriage. But it's not so ideal if you have that idea. You can waste this season by idolizing marriage and by focusing on it so much that maybe you actually get bitter when somebody else gets into a relationship. And in your heart, you're saying, that should be me. I'm prettier than her. I got way more money than that dude. I look so much better than him. Why is he, why does he have a girlfriend? Why is she getting engaged? This is not fair. I don't like her, right? And that sounds silly. I can't tell you how many times that's happened in my three years since being here. It's really sad. And so it's like, hey, this season is terrible. I just want to get through it. But Solomon would say, no, no, no. Don't waste it. Invest it. Don't spend it. Invest it. Make the most of it. It is a precious season to be fruitful for the Lord. It's a precious season to be fruitful. Listen, you, your responsibilities are so much less today than they will be. You don't have a spouse 
probably don't have a mortgage. You don't have kids. You have, in one sense, a divine opportunity to pursue godliness in a manner in which you will never have such flexibility to chase after Jesus. And so you could say, I just, I just hate being single. I, I hate it. I know life will be better if I'm in a relationship. And yeah, there are certain ways in which it'll be much better. But what Solomon is saying is, <clears throat> don't be an <clears throat> opportunity waster. Be a moment maker. While God has given you the gift of singleness at present, use it well. So here's what you can do. Go to every class Redeemer offers so that you can deepen your understanding of theology and broaden your knowledge of the Bible while you still have most weeknights free. Or attend the RPM monthly prayer nights. Keenan just had one two days ago. Go to those so you can learn how to pray because you're going to use that your whole life. Go to Saturday night RPM evangelism that Noah leads so that you can learn how to cultivate the skill of preaching the gospel to strangers because then it makes it a whole lot easier to preach the gospel to everybody you do know. Or discipline yourself now while every night is free to read good Christian books by men like the Puritans and really dig that well of holiness in your life. Make the most of your weekends. You don't have to go see your in-laws and you're not going to Tucson to visit, uh, I don't know, your sister-in-law. You're here. Use those weekends to make disciples. Use those weekends to invest in other believers so that they grow strong in their faith. Don't spend it pining away at home, frittering it away on entertainment until finally you can get married. No, no, you have a golden opportunity. Pursue Jesus in this season that you have. And when God decides it's good for you to have a girlfriend or boyfriend who becomes a spouse, praise the Lord. But right now, your season is great to pursue Christ and to really maximize your life, to optimize your spirituality so that you become all that Jesus Christ calls you to be. And by the way, when you live this way, your marketability as a future spouse skyrockets because you are exactly what every godly man or woman is looking for. But you don't do it for that reason. You do it because Christ is worthy. And, and when you do it, when you make the most of your singleness, then you're really doing what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.35. You're pursuing undistracted devotion. Now, that doesn't mean you can't pursue Christ if you're in a relationship. Obviously, you can. doesn't mean you can't pursue Christ if you're married. Obviously, you can and you should. But you just have different challenges, different interests you have to balance with your husband and your wife that most of you don't have in this season of life. So what Solomon would say to you earnestly is capitalize on this season. Don't waste it dreaming for the next because you'll miss the immense opportunity to honor Jesus and be like Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, he was a man who never wasted a moment. Maybe you remember what he said in John 9, 4. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Jesus was a moment maker. Jesus capitalized on every opportunity. He always had his vision Open, how may I serve God? He did it perfectly so. And what a wonderful example of never wasting, never squandering, always capitalizing and seizing the moment. And in fact, he did it so well and so fully and thoroughly that it landed him on a Roman cross. And he worked the works of God so well that he bore the wrath of God. That he took the sins of man. That he suffered in our place. And that Jesus burst open the doors of heaven through his work. His dutiful, faithful, unceasing work. And so it's because Jesus was the perfect worker that you have the opportunity to appropriate perfect salvation. It doesn't come by you working hard. 
He worked hard. You get it by faith and repentance, by trusting in Christ. And so there's one moment you don't, 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 don't want to miss. One moment you don't want to squander. It's the moment that Isaiah 55, 6 talks about. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. See, you actually could do everything I'm talking about in this sermon and just kill it at work, kill it in your finances, kill it in your personal life at home. You could just be an outstanding person. But if you never respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ to repent and place your faith in him, then you have actually squandered the moment that matters most. Some of you, many of you, oh, you're trusting in Christ. And so you've done well to not miss that moment. But others of you, in a room this size, it has to be true. There are others who've never capitalized on the moment called salvation. And so my plea for you is, don't squander it. Don't let tonight pass you by and say, ah, I'll get to it. I'm young. You may be dead tomorrow. Yeah, you're young, but you might be in a grave. So don't miss that moment. Because then when you've capitalized on the greatest moment, a.k.a. salvation, then you're able to take advantage of all the other moments. Like Solomon was encouraging Lazy Boy Larry. So there's a reason we read biographies. Because they have this unique capacity to teach us things ahead of our time to watch and learn and observe and say, I see what he did there. I don't want to do what he did there. But I do want to imitate him there. And so the biography of Lazy Boy Larry is just loaded with life lessons for us. Be a productivity promoter. Be a self-starter. Be a moment maker. But don't do it to be great. Do it because when you walk in wisdom, you honor the God of wisdom. And when you honor the God of wisdom, he gets the glory that he deserves, right? So let's learn from Lazy Boy Larry. And whatever ways are relevant to us as individuals so that we can walk in wisdom and give glory to the God of wisdom. Let's pray. Father Solomon's words aren't exactly comfortable. And there, yeah, there are disquieting, uncomfortable realities when we think deeply about what he said to the sluggard. Because there is in all of us the capacity to be lazy. And we don't want to do that, Father. We don't want to promote foolish or folly and foolish thinking. Lord, help us to respond in the way that is most pertinent to us so that we can walk in wisdom and work hard, so that we can imitate Christ who worked hard. I pray that you would do your work through your word in your people and do it tonight so that we may resemble more closely our blessed Savior. We ask in his name. Amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in to our Redeemer YouTube channel. If this is helpful for you, please make sure that you like this video, smash the subscribe button, and hit that bell icon. It will help us reach more people with biblical truth. Thank you so much.